My name is Thor Hoy. I'm a Chief Justice of Kristen Walk in Oyate, a Traveler Association in South Dakota. I also sit on two other appellate boards, appellate boards that may be more relevant. One is the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Spring Reservation in Oregon. But maybe most relevant here is I sit on the Intertribal Court of Appeals for Nevada, which represents almost all of the tribes in Nevada except for two. Uh, which is uh, something that has been talked about here as sort of inner travel court of appeals, and it works. It does work. Uh, it works really well. Uh, I have a couple of comments, and then obviously we'll take questions. Um, I want to start with saying that Simmons v. Park, good work in NARC and everybody else in the Metro Court, that case is an invitation to all of you. It's an invitation to all of you to build an appellate court and to use it. So please accept it because the state of Alaska says, do it. And we'll let you guys do your own law. And we won't interfere anymore. And it's about sovereignty, guys. So accept the invitation, do it. You finally got that, that case that everybody's been wondering if it would happen or not. You have it. So build your appellate courts. And if you build your appellate court, people will use it because they see that it's there. This has been I've been on new appellate courts and old appellate courts, and the old ones are entrenched and they happen. The new ones, people realize that it's there, and cases start coming in the door, okay? Because they want to see that there is this process. So please accept the invitation of Simmons v. Park. It is what you have been waiting for, it is what you need to grasp onto, it is what you need to ride, because it is your sovereignty. And it it's not about, it's about your people, Right? And it will benefit your people. If it benefits the tribal people, the village people, it will benefit your villages. And then this thing will build to be bigger and bigger. And eventually, you don't have to worry about what the stamp allows it says. That's what I think you should not worry about anyway. Um, so anyway, I wanted to say that. That's your, that's your PR for today. So there's some, there's some other things I want to talk about more specifically here. Um, a couple of points, because these guys have covered everything. So I'll reiterate some things and maybe bring up a couple new ones. There is a danger to using your political body as your appellate board. Guys, I know it's traditional. I know it's often traditional. But due process is implicated in a major, major way. And if we're going to accept the invitation of Simmons v. Park, we should probably reconsider using a political body as I just want to put that out there. There's a lot of philosophical discussion we can have about that. I'm willing to do that out in the hallway for as long as you want. Um, but I would argue that you should probably look at constituting another board. Um, and I'm, I have a more glib way when I teach this kind of Indian country law stuff about due process. I have a much more glib way of saying this. I'm just going to say it to you all. Due process in Indian country is what we say it is. Okay? It is what we say it is. There are some touchstones that we need to do, and these folks have talked about those really well. But basically, your courts can look like whatever you want your courts to look like. Okay? And do it. It's your, it's your village. It's your village. It's your people. Make it look like what you want it to look like. I work in all kinds of courts. They look different. Some look like Western courts, and I wear a robe instead of a big bench, and some aren't that way at all. I show up in jeans and a shirt, and we just talk things through. But they're all courts that have the same kind of value. Okay? So whatever you want it to be, you just do it. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit, because Lisa's has asked me to do this, the role of the appellate court in a kind of a, uh, a bigger sense. It is not supposed to be a second bite at the apple, as um, we say in law school. What we mean by that is you don't get to retry your case. Okay? But the truth of the matter is they're going to retry the case. Okay? And you accept that. And that's just the way it is. That's just part of working in appellate courts in Indian country, and it's okay. That's what we want it to be, so that's what we do. Okay. We try to stick to the law. We try not to take new testimony. We try to look at the law as it's applied to the facts taken at the lower court. But the truth of the matter is, you're gonna have litigants that are before you without attorneys coming to the appellate court, and they're going to tell you the whole story. And you're gonna listen politely, and you're gonna listen and take it all in. And that's our role because they want to feel that they are being heard and heard and heard. And if they feel that they've been heard and they still lose the decision, they're okay with it. They're okay with it because that's what we do. We provide them a forum for them to 
tell the story again. And I think that's very important in what we do. And so we make time in our public courts. We don't give them 10 minutes of argument and move on. We we'll talk, because we can. And that's the beauty of Indian courts, is we can let people talk, and we can take in all kinds of testimony. It's our courts, we do what we want. All right, so the reality is they're gonna retry the cases, and they're gonna try to. It's really fun when you get attorneys in front of you in an appellate court, because then it's a justice you can handle, and you get to, you get to act like your Chief Justice Roberts or whatever, and, and you just kind of be jerky to them. But when it's, when it's uh, the uh, self-represented litigants in front of you, it's a different story. We do it differently, like you do in your courts, uh, in the villages. One of the things that I've heard at least one attorney talk about was uh, he uh, was afraid of the, the role of custom and tradition that is used in the village courts and how that would be reflected at an appellate level. And my answer then and is now and will be tomorrow is that's okay. We know how to do that. We know how to do that. We know how to do custom and tradition because that's fact finding. That's what the lower court does. We just accept it as the fact that there is a customer tradition of whatever village to do whatever it is they did. And we just apply that to the law on the issue. The one thing that I will ask, and I will demand as an appellate court justice, is that just make sure your code says that you can accept custom and tradition of ethics. That's all. One line. Just put one line in your code so we can accept custom and tradition of ethics. Whatever your custom tradition is, it is what it is. And we, we can deal with that. It's not that big a deal for a appellate court. We don't get into whether you know, it has to be red or blue. We just accept what the lower court said about it. And that's how we go. So it's not that big a deal. And the beauty of it is, after the appellate court makes a decision based upon that fact finding, it's no longer custom and tradition. It's the law of that village. So there's no more argument about it. Because when you kind of wash it through the system, right? It no longer becomes something you can argue about. It becomes a law. Because back in that case, back in 05, they said that the customer tradition was to do whatever, and therefore it's law. Well, it's kind of a nice thing, you see. So you don't keep on arguing about it. It kind of becomes a law after it goes through the system. Just make sure your code route reflects that, though. Customer tradition is allowed as evidence. Uh, court rules are huge. You've heard everybody say it. Well, I'll say it too. Peer pressure, I suppose. Um, you need to follow your rules because we look at your rules more often than not i kick cases because they were not filed in time or they were filed incorrectly for some reason usually really late I don't know what it is. Um, sometimes not for filing fees but it just really depends on your rules um, related to that issue is this idea that there has to be no, there doesn't have to be magic words. It's whatever your rules say. So some courts demand that you have a certain form and you use certain kinds of fonts and whatever else. Well, you don't necessarily want to do that. Those are pretty, those are courts that are really westernized, you know, and require certain sorts of kinds of things. And I work in those courts. But there are other courts I work in that would accept a, a plea and say, hey judge, I think you got this wrong and here's why. Well, I'll accept that as an appeal. Great, go we'll serve that on the other side. Let's, let's note this thing up for appeal. Because we can, we can. That's due process, that's what our tribal folks do. Right, that's what we do, we help our people. We're not here to hammer them because they didn't obey you know, X, Y, Z, right? We're able to move things a little bit so that there's a happy conclusion or at least a reasonable conclusion based upon the merits of the case. We don't necessarily have to kick people out because they missed you know, subsection D of this rule on the back of a book that's sitting on the shelf in the clerk's office. That's not what we do. We would, I would accept in most of my books uh, this paragraph saying that there's a problem and I want to resolve it. Well, okay, file it and let's get on with our job. Again, need for a record. This, this is probably the most common thing that happens, is there's no record. I got an email this morning. When we were talking about this session this morning, I had an email that said, uh, council's looking for a record. I said, well, we don't have your record because you didn't make a record. So often what we do is we write an order saying, go back and make a record. Well, that's horrible because you're essentially retrying the case, right? To go and reconstitute a record because we can't do anything. Unless there's a record, 
video is great, audio works great. One of the two, audio is cheap. So there's really no reason for there not being a record and we really need records because we don't try the case again. We don't do that. We take the record, we listen to the arguments that counsel make before the appellate board or litigants make before the appellate board and we apply the law. We do not try the case again. That's what your courts do. Your, court, your courts try the case. But having a record is crucial. More often than not, in various courts, especially the Inter-Tribal Court of Appeals in Nevada, we send the cases back for them to go and make the record, and they have to try it again. So it's a waste of time, money, effort, and you're not going to get the same result twice, and the judges are not there anymore, litigants have moved on, et cetera, et cetera. It's a horrible thing. It's easier to step in for them than it's far so. You absolutely don't have to have an attorney. Okay. I know this is a deal with the state of Alaska, but there has to be a I think they seem to think that due process involves having expensive attorneys, and that's not true. Uh, more often than not, in our Indian courts, our tribal courts, it's self represented litigants. Either the attorneys aren't available, or they're too expensive, or whatever reason. So due process does not mean you have to have attorneys. I enjoy it when attorneys are not there often because you get to the result a little bit quicker and easier and uh, it's not obfuscated by attorneys. Um, you can get to the right result. Um, and again, no magic words are necessary for appeals. You have to sort of your rules say. Make your rules work for you. Your rules say that, hey, judge, uh, a couple sentences that I was able to write down because I've only three. You know, okay, that's an appeal. And that's why you have a court system, because they can kind of turn that into an appeal. Like, okay, you know, this is what it is, and then the judges can work with you. Because we work with our litigants, that's what we do. We are not sitting down in Juno thinking that we are getting law from upon high. You know, we work with our litigants. There is great wisdom in having an intra-tribal court of appeals. And there's great wisdom in that, and I would implore all of you to consider banding together in whatever groups make sense, because it's cheaper. It's cheaper. And you can then get whatever talents you want to sit on that, that inter-tribal court of appeals whenever you may need them. You may need them every month. You may need them once a decade but it's cheaper and nobody has to carry the full cost of paying for that court of appeals because the court of appeals costs money. And I would suggest that you think carefully about the, how that court of appeals is constructed in terms of the board and the composition of the court of appeals because at the end of the day, you have another audience. And in Indian country, we always have another audience. And we know who it is, right? It's always the state of which looking in on us. You have to be cognizant of the state always looking in at what we do. We're going to do what we're going to do. Because we're in it, right? We're going to do what we're going to do. But you I cannot operate with the blinders of saying, oh, I don't care what the state's going to do. We always know the state's going to be back there. Because you can always be appealed. Yes, Simmons B. Park says that you've got to exhaust tribal remedies. That great phrase. So you've got to go through the appeal, appeals process of the village courts and its appeals courts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the end of litigation. It could then go to a federal or state court if it's the right cause of action, if it's the right issue in the case, okay? So you're not done just because you have a, a court of appeals. Now what a court of appeals and exhaustion of your remedies might very well mean, and in my experience it does mean, is that you're going to win. Okay. That, that court that you go to yeah. after the now, Tribal Court of Appeals is going to look at the Tribal Court of Appeals and say, yeah, they got it. Moving on now. And they're not going to really bother so much with it. That's more typical than not. So there's a real, you see how this works to kind of cement your sovereignty, right? You're, by building these courts of appeals, you're kind of insulating yourself from the state uh, action or inaction. You almost start to not care what they do because you've got your system that's working and they're going to defer or respect your decisions if they're well-reasoned and it looks like there's a good process. 
it's very important that you do that, in my opinion, because that's how you build on the sovereignty for your people and your in your villages. Okay? This is an important tool. So you will have state and federal courts that federal courts do this very well. They defer to appeals, uh, private court appeals opinions, and they defer to them all the time because we're able to look to the, the law and write an opinion based upon the law and well reason and off we go. So it's a good thing. I only have a, maybe another point here and then I'll take questions. The, the three outs that Gordon Scott's going to be part, uh, Simmons View Parks. This, where, where Simmons View Parks gives, they try to take away. And I think it's, I don't know, I don't think it's irony, I think it's just silly, uh, these three outs, because these three outs are things that an appeals court would bump a case for. All right, the three outs that they're worried about, you would appeal those to an appeals court, a travel court of appeals, and the Tribal Court of Appeals would bump them anyway for lack of jurisdiction or for misuse of process. or So I, I think it's kind of funny and maybe um, uh, maybe a little patronizing. Yeah, see if last year would be patronizing. Uh, maybe a little patronizing on, on the part of the Supreme Court where they're giving a little bit, but at the same time they're saying, but be wary, be wary. Well, that's what the Court of Appeals could do anyway. So if you have these any of these three issues where you're worried about, you know, a jurisdiction or an issues of process or something like that. Appeals courts knock those out all the time. Yeah, you know what, uh, trial court, you actually didn't have jurisdiction over the child, I'm sorry. So this case is now at rest, and off you go. So it's kind of self-proving, I suppose, in one sense. So I, I would worry less about those three outs. I would just build an appeals court, or appeals courts, many of them, that respect the process and, and apply the law to the facts, and off you go. You've just insulated yourself from the state even further and created your sovereignty in a, in a bigger way. That's all I have to say about that. Well, we'll take questions. 